My name is Scott Wolf. I'm CEO of Aaron Medical. Aaron is um, actually uh, concerned with why we have evolved a nose, and um, no other primate or animal has one, and what that means for our breathing. Um, but uh, along those lines, I was actually fascinated by um, what you said about the morphologic changes in, in the bowel. Um, and that is something that uh, the changes in the bowel actually um, have real neurohormonal um, influence uh, in, in how we digest food, how satiety um, is, is uh, transmitted. Is that something that, uh, that you could comment on further? In, in terms of looking at then at, at sort of neurological impulses from the, from the gut in, in terms of providing impact on satiety. That's right, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the key issues then that we're seeing with dietary change in the modern world is the fact that overall we're consuming diets today that are even more refined and even less bulky than our evolutionary past. I think consequently we're consuming foods that are no longer whole foods where we're not getting the entire nutrient packages um, in a, single, in a single meal. As a consequence, I think you're exactly right, that this is leading to situations where s signals of satiety that we have evolved to cue in on are no longer um, in place in terms of the foods that we're eating. Thank you. Morton, and I'm a director of bariatric surgery here at Stanford, and my main field of interest and devotion is around dealing with people who are, oh, are obese. And it's interesting to hear these thoughts about evolution and obesity. Clearly the consequences of too much of a good thing when it comes to the ability to uh, extract energy is obesity. And if you look at some of the consequences recently, it's occurred pretty quickly. You know, you show the NHANES data, behavioral risk factor survey data, methodology hasn't changed. And if you look, most of the increases occurred over 18 years or so. And if we'd kept stuff at 1990 levels for obesity, we'd have more than enough money to pay for health care reform. So it's something we've got to look at when it comes to dealing with it. That being said, in 18 years, what has changed? The gene pool probably hasn't changed too much. I don't think we had Martians come down and land and give us some obesity genes. Uh, maybe some other things have changed. Maybe it's been uh, nurture, something that happens when we impart lessons to our family about what to eat and what not to eat. And I think the one thing that comes up when you have this rapid change, you got to consider, is there some sort of uh, environmental impact? And the environmental impact to me is around probably three areas, antibiotics, probably also around estrogen, and also around insulin. Uh, some thoughts about some of the environmental impacts that might be occurring. Well, to step back from, for one moment, I, I would agree with you that the changes that we're looking at can't be attributed to changes in the gene pool. I do think, though, what we are doing now with, our, with the changes in our modern diet is we are exposing our genes to nutritional environments that are completely different than we have ever seen throughout much of our evolutionary past in terms of energy density, lack of volume of, of well, lack of volume overall of the diet and the fact that it is much more nutritionally dense than ever before. And the fact that we now as well have the uncoupling of energetic density with nutrient density, which is something that would have been atypical in whole foods, essentially. So I think that's part of it, the fact that we're exposing our, our genes to novel environments. I would agree that I think the other driving environmental factors there are going to be a lot of them. I think activity is part of it. I also think that you know, there are a whole, the way we plan out our cities and our daily lives is such that as a normal part of our workaday world, we get relatively little discretionary activity. And I think that's, that's another big piece that's it's coming into play. How do you see antibiotics playing into this? So one follow-up thing on the exercise component, I agree, we need to emphasize it more. That being said, 3,500 calories need to be uh, expended one way or another to yeah. lose it. It's a lot easier not to take it in than it is to, um, to take it off. 
And it's, we have a finely tuned balance around our weight. An extra 150 calories a day results in 10 extra pounds at the end of the year. Getting to the point about the antibiotics is uh, permutations, permutations in the microflora, the bacteria yeah. we've got in our gut. This is a coevolution, right, where you got those bacteria that allow you to digest things. You did a fantastic job in showing how we're omnivores. We can eat anything. And part of the reason we can eat anything is because we've got these little bacteria helping us out. Now, we had a lot of antibiotics recently in, in our introduction here. If you go to tap water, you can find antibiotics, for heaven's sake. The whole hygiene theory, you know, around wiping all the last bit of bacteria away. So that's, that's my thought around the antibiotics, how they might be playing a role. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Well, there's a whole additional dimension I'd just like to, uh, to raise about the agricultural diet, which uh, you didn't touch upon in your talk, but I know that you've thought about. I wonder if you could, before we get to the audience questions, if you could just say a little bit about the, the um, um, paleolithic diet and the concepts behind it. Yeah, one of the things that is actually kind of interesting looking at dietary aspects from an evolutionary perspective is that Evolutionary takes on diet were really, I would say, at the leading edge of evolutionary medicine, dating back to the classic 1985 paper by Boyd Eaton and Mel Conner in the New England Journal of Medicine, really helping to de define the notion of Paleolithic nutrition. Put evolution on the map in terms of looking at diet. My critique of that, however, has been that it's a very narrow way of looking at human nutritional evolution, in as much as it largely discounts any evolutionary change over the last 10 to 15,000 years. And increasingly, we know that there are many important dietary adaptations, genetic innovations that have occurred over that time period, lactose, lactase persistence, lactose tolerance, um, the, the salivary amylase genes that were recently discussed, lots of dietary adaptations that have occurred since the advent of agriculture. And so I think what we're seeing evolutionarily over the last 10,000 years is human populations in large measure adapting to their distinct ecological niches, with one of the themes being consistent across all of those multiple different different adaptations being that need for the high quality diet and also relatively high inputs of work and labor. Now, one of the questions that has come up in some of the recent renderings of, of Paleolithic nutrition is whether or not, is whether or not um, cereal grains are actually a major, a major problem in terms of human nutritional health. My thinking on that is that Cereal grains are going to present a problem for certain populations, but not entirely across the board. And I think here is where recent genetic history, recent population ancestry is going to have a lot to do with things. OK, well, a lot more to be said, but uh, many, quest many hands raised. Uh, <laughs> take your pick. I'm not. Uh... Uh, great. Well, thank you. That was very, very interesting. I'm wondering if. Um, we can use a comparative approach to understand human obesity beyond the calories in, calories out paradigm. And specifically, um, there are animal, natural animal models, um, mm -hmm. sort of parallel, let's say, epidemics of obesity, and not just in companion mm -hmm. animals, although I think it's almost 50% of our cats and dogs are apparently BMIs in the obese range. Um, but even some feral populations, there's a trend toward obesity. And does that argue for these kind of endocrine modifiers that could be, uh, not just endocrine, I'm sorry, environmental modifiers, including antibiotics and uh, hormones, et cetera? I would say it probably does, that, that I think there is, you know, there is a, a sort of larger environmental change, environmental phenomenon here that is going to be leveraging many aspects of our biology in terms of predisposing us to obesity as well as sort of other elements of our, of our society and population. I think the other consideration, too, we talked about environmental exposures, too, as being something causative because you see such a rapid change. But the other thought, and welcome ideas about it, is have we reached a tipping point? You know, are we at the edge of the of the world now in terms of what is a fine balance, and it didn't take a lot more to 
push us over? Did we just kind of see the final edge? And that might be occurring because we have a finely tuned system. What's our thermostat? What is the point of no return when it comes to weight? For us, you know, when we treat obesity, it's probably a BMI over 30. After that, it becomes very, very difficult to treat. Let me, let me just piggyback on that. This kind of strict input-output uh, way of thinking about things, that has to be too simple. Aren't there numerous post-ingestion strategies which would, which would be uh, influencing there? So how do we go beyond a strict sort of input-output way of thinking? Well, I mean, I, you're right that ultimately a strict input-output analysis is, is too simplistic. Ultimately, though, it does have to we have to reduce it down to energy. An energetics perspective is ultimately going to be driving what the major, what the major changes are here. Um, you know, other, aspects, other aspects of our lifestyle that have changed with industrialization, you know, something that we, we've looked at with our, with our field research, just how much energy is typically expended heating and cooling the body. And the fact that we now live, you know, in largely climate-controlled environments, not exposing ourselves to the, you know, the major changes in temperature that are brought about in the, ex in the external world as traditional populations have, that's going to be another factor that's going to, to shift things. Additionally, obviously, the, you know, the role of infectious disease and the fact that when you look at nutritional health in many, many parts of the developing world, so much of growth and development in children is being compromised by competition with those infecting parasites, raising metabolic needs, and also limiting uptake of, of nutrients. We also know that you know, during development, that the scarring that occurs in the GI system due to those high parasite loads will, is going to limit nutrient and you know, food uptake during the entire growth period and, and into adulthood is going to sort of limit capacity in that regard. Right. I, I'm sorry, I have a general question about uh, the comparative studies. How do you control for the, our different longevities across um, our Paleolithic ancestors and, and uh, indigenous populations? Obviously, we slow down as we get older, and our current diet is very successful at passing on our genes, obviously. So um, can you comment on that? Well, and so, I mean, I think from that perspective, so many of the problems that we're seeing in our modern world are associated with adaptive strategies for holding on to calories that would have been important early in life in order to get you to the stage where you're going to be able to reproduce, but as our, as our longevity increases, as our lifespan increases, they now become increasingly detrimental. Um, I think Scott's point about passing on genes, you know, we're saying it, it, it hasn't changed. It might, you know, if you carry extra weight, your fertility rates go down. I think the big question out for all of us right now, what is survival of the fattest going to look like? You know, yeah. what will that look like down the road? We will be looking at life expectancy going down. We will be looking at increased cost. If you happen to live until you're in your 60s and you're obese, what's your reward? Most likely dementia. So we have a lot of things to contend with from an evolutionary standpoint if we continue in the same direction. Hmm. Um, someone's doing the picking. Where's the mic? I have to ask, what are your thoughts on GMOs? I know soy was genetically modified to fatten pigs. I know that over 90% of soy is now genetically modified. So if it's fattening up the pigs, what's it doing to us? And I know when I was a kid, I ate a lot of sugar, a lot, a lot of sugar. And I wasn't a kid that long ago. And <laughs> now kids are eating um, sweets with genetically modified high fructose corn syrup. And this food was on our, put on our shelves around the same time that this obesity epidemic started. What are your thoughts on that? And so in terms of the yeah, high fructose corn syrup question, I think that's quite honestly an open debate in terms of whether or not it is being utilized differently than sucrose or glucose in terms of, in terms of the potential for greater fat storage, greater storage of energy, energy in that regard. In terms of genetically modified foods, honestly, when you, when you look at the arc of human history, agriculture itself is, in many respects, parallel to GMO for the, you know, that agriculture is all about manipulating the genetic structure of what were initially 
wild plant species in order to increase their nutritional density, increase their digestibility in order to make more calories available in a given area of, of land. And so GMOs in and of themselves being a big driver in the obesity epidemic, I think- We have gone too far with that. Potentially so, yes. In terms of the, the level of nutrient density, that is definitely true but that's a larger par portion, I would say, of what is more generally occurring with, with the human diet, with industrialization. Uh, excellent talk about and fascinated by the fact that our calories haven't gone up, it's just a lack of energy expenditure. So maybe, John, you should just implant enough electrodes in each patient that constantly move muscles. Like We've shown in quadriplegics where we can implant enough for a functional electrical system for biking to get rid of calories. Perhaps in our humans, instead of just bypassing our GI tract, just implant electrodes to maintain our energy expenditure by moving muscles. I've seen that ad on late night TV, actually, <laughs> <laughs> with the belt you put around, and it looks great, doesn't it? Um, I mean, for one, it, <laughs> people have actually done it, Ray, and, and uh, it, what happens is there's a learned effect to the muscle after a while. You've got to vary it one way or the other, and we've learned that through exercise that, you know, uh, variety makes a big difference. Frankly, the biggest thing you can do when it comes to physical activities don't do what we're doing right now, which is sitting, you know, standing up. We've instituted a policy, at least in my clinic, all meetings are standing up now. It makes them shorter, incidentally. And, uh, <laughs> but exercise makes a big difference, I agree, mainly for locking in that weight loss, giving you that buffer. Maybe you're not perfect today. Maybe you went 200 calories over, but you walked today, so that gives you the buffer. Exercise does make a difference, but it's not gonna be everything. In response to some of the previous questions, there was a lot of little things going on all at once, and it's hard to disentangle them all. But the key is we've got to start in one area to help figure it out. My, my question is, um, and I would comment on um, the nutritional density versus the quality, the quality of the foods. I think we're eating more food. Um, I would question how nutritional it is. Um, and, but my second question, my, my question is really, when you talk about the very obese people, um, what kind of studies are um, focused on the intake of the, the quality of the nutrition and how it's pushing uh, perhaps our hormones to an addictive level. Um, because I th it just seems like it's not just an issue of exercise for a lot of people. Getting back to your original point, I think you're exactly right that the, the trend here is a lot of small things coming together. And so actually being able to isolate it to A, B, or C is going to be tough because it's going to be a synergy. In terms of our diets themselves, I think your point is, is dead on. That what, is, what we have done is we have now created diets that are where energy density is largely uncoupled from the density of other diets. That, was, that is the beauty part of eating whole foods, traditional societies. That in those cases, if you're eating whole foods, chances are if you're fulfilling your caloric needs, you're also meeting your daily nutrient requirements at the same time. Today, all of those satiety, all of those satiety signals that were evolved in response to consuming whole foods are now being thrown completely out of whack because we have uncoupled caloric density from nutrient density, and I think it's, it's then providing the underpinning for the kind of hormonal cascades that, that you were alluding to. You're exactly right. That's what's occurred. You know, if you look at our very obese population, uh, they're calorically replete, but nutrition, nutritionally depleted. And that's evidenced by virtue of fact, if you look at their vitamin levels, B12, iron, calcium, and these are large patients. You wonder, how can they be depleted? but they are when they come in because they eat food that doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it. You know, a lot of enriched, a lot of uh, foods like white bread, um, all those different kinds that carry a lot of calories but not necessarily a lot of the vitamins that come with it. Plus, we don't know enough in nutrition, quite honestly, what makes a broccoli, you know, so valuable to us. You know, we haven't broken it all down to figure out maybe it's just more than two plus two equals four. There's a lot of other things going on there in terms of complexity, in terms of how it interacts with bacteria, with hormones, a lot. Let's keep it natural is what I would say at the end of the day.
You know, there, um, there's also uh, the most uh, dense uh, nutritional, uh, calorie dense foods are, are sugars and carbohydrates, and those uh, raise insulin levels and spike insulin, and insulin's very toxic to your system. Um, and it also changes the way that your uh, gut digests food. So different um, uh, materials are going to different parts of your gut. So um, there's actual, you know, very measurable changes. We have time for one more question. Well, this is a short question. It's specific. Uh, what, if any, effect does microwaving have on the nutrition of food? We all do it. It's happening in schools and everywhere. Thank you. Um, I, I would say, you know, from a physical standpoint, you know, all it does is heat up the food. Does it break it down in a way so your body doesn't even have to work harder? Probably not. I think the biggest thing that goes on with the foods uh, when you microwave them is your selection of foods, i.e. what are you putting in to that microwave? You're putting in what? Stuff that's generally not good. Hopefully it's you're heating up some leftovers that you made the night before. That's the best microwave food you can find. So uh, I think that's all I can tell you about microwave um, uh, technology. Okay, so let's thank our uh, speakers here.